Hello everyone and welcome to our lunchtime series of webinars here with the Ireland chapter of the PMI. This is Katrina speaking to you as the events director. Today I'm delighted to say that we have Elizabeth Harron to speak to us about stakeholder engagement. Hi Elizabeth, thank you for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me today. So she's going to speak to us today about stakeholder engagement or how to get people to take action on your projects. And I'm sure that we can all agree that stakeholder engagement is key to the success of our projects. But how do we engage them? So you'll notice that Elizabeth's presentation today is about stakeholder engagement. So she's looking at the differences between management and engagement in a project led environment. And she's going to provide us with some practical tips of doing engagement and encouraging participation through some game mechanics. So thank you again for joining us to, today, Elizabeth. Now, before we move on, I just want to say a word of thanks to our sponsor, Auxilian. So a lot of you may be familiar with the name. They're part of the IT Alliance Group, which is established here in Ireland back in 1997 as an international IT solutions and services company. Among other things, they have a consultancy arm and they help organizations with digital transformations. Certification and accreditation are central to how they practice their business and a large number of the Auxilian project managers are PMP certified as well as PRINCE2 certified and are members of the PMI chapter here in Ireland. Auxilian are also ISO certified and a Microsoft Gold partner. They operate with clients right across the public and the private sector, so it's likely that you have worked with them directly or indirectly at some stage here if you're based in, in, in Ireland and indeed internationally. Your membership and support from our sponsors make these regular webinars and events possible. So thanks again to our sponsor Auxilian and thanks to our members. Now before I hand over to Elizabeth as usual I'm going to let you know that we have some questions for you today. I've already kicked off the Menti poll in the background. Elizabeth will have some questions for you to gauge your input and get your interaction as we move through the webinar as well. So please grab your phone, go to menti.com and type in the code that you see on the screen there in front of you. We will try to take your questions as we move through the webinar and maybe take a Q&A at the end if there is time. So without further ado, Elizabeth, thank you very much. I shall hand over the, the reins to you. OK, so shall I share my screen? I will do that and hopefully you can all see my slides. So um, you can give me a thumbs up in Zoom or just uh, nod to say it's there. Yeah, <laughs> Katrina's smiling. I'm smiling and saying I can see them, but yeah, absolutely, guys, um, give a thumbs up. And I'm going to share the code again in a couple of seconds to you. So, Elizabeth, take it away and I'll get chatting in the background with everyone. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me um, in your lunchtime webinar today. As Katrina said, I'm going to share some practical techniques for engaging stakeholders in a project environment with a take on how we can use game mechanics to do so. So... Uh, let's get started. So what we're talking about is how to encourage participation on projects through, like I say, game mechanics and all will become clear. I will explain that. What we're going to be looking at is what is gamification in projects and why it matters. Is it something you should be interested in using? Is it a technique you could think of different ways to apply? Or do you think it's just a fad? And I will be asking you your, your views on that later. So hold those thoughts. And then that will give us the what. And what we'll be talking about as well is the how. And there are five principles of engagification, game, gamification on projects for engagement purposes that we can use. And I'll give you some clues as to how they're used in, in other ways and how you could perhaps use them on your projects as well to support your project teams and to deliver your work successfully with a ton of engagement from people. So I've created a little PDF handout for you if you want it. You can go open up another window. You've got Menti on one place. You can go and uh, download this as well. It's a PDF with some notes in so you can follow along, fill things in, and you can uh, then keep that as a reminder of what we've talked about today. And uh, Katrina also has a copy of that and a copy of the slides. So you will get all of the materials later on. Yep, um, but, as it's, <laughs> but as it's a live session, I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to grab that and, uh, and follow along as we go. Um, I suppose I should introduce myself a little bit more, really. Uh, Katrina's already said, I'm Elizabeth Harrin. I write the blog Girls Guide to Project Management, and I've written a handful of books as well. And gamification is about a page in my most recent book, which is the Engaging Stakeholders on Project book by, by APM, but published by APM last month. 
Um, but I think it's such a fascinating topic about how we can actually engage people and work more effectively together as a team that I wanted to, to have the opportunity to talk more about it. So um, that's where this presentation has come from, really. Right, I've mentioned this gamification thing quite a lot and I feel like it's time that we need to discuss what it, <laughs> what it actually is and what I'm talking about. So gamification techniques tap into and influence people's natural desires for competition, achievement, recognition and self-expression. And that is not my definition, that is a definition from um, some APM research that was done back in 2014. The, the guide there, the introduction to gamification guide is available online, but frankly, it's old, it's outdated. Gamification theory has moved on, especially in relation to how we can apply it in the workplace. So the definition is still relevant, but I think the thinking has moved on a bit, um, a bit more than perhaps that, that guide lets us, uh, shows at the time. So let me show you some examples of the types of gamification that you probably see regularly, even if it's not necessarily in a business context. So frequent flyer programs, no, not that many people are traveling these days, but anything that involves loyalty cards or stamps or collect points for whatever reason, even Tesco's and the supermarkets. Countdowns, things like even an advent calendar, you're counting down and engaging on every single day, taking a small step to a, a larger goal. And collecting badges. So this is a screenshot of, um, of my Facebook group from Facebook and you can see there are a selection of different badges that Facebook can put next to my profile to show different things and if you're part of a forum then you might have seen badges and things like that before. So let's check out um, some assumptions that you might hold about gamification for workplace interactions. I'd like you to have those in mind as we go through the end of uh, the go through the session today and perhaps by the end you may well have, have changed your mind or confirmed your belief. So let's see. So the first menti.com question that I have for you is, do you think gamification is useful or appropriate for work? So Katrina's got the poll open, so you can click over to that. And then um, Katrina, if you can take back slide. Yep, you want me to show you? We, can, we can see the results. Okay, I shall share it now. And uh, yep, so hopefully you can see that there. So guys, again, just grab your phone, go to menti.com. If you have a second screen, you can you can do this as well. It can be hard to figure these things out if you just have the one monitor. Um, but there, Elizabeth, hopefully you can see that on the screen. Do I can, yes. Useful. So yep, we've got 20 so, responses so far. Few people there saying the majority said settling on uh, yes, that's quite good. I don't know, no. <laughs> I think um, when I first you know, years ago when I first heard about gamification, I thought that's not going to work for work. It's just a business buzzword, fad thing. But as I've learned more about it, I've come to appreciate that we can take some of the concepts that keep us playing games and, and transfer them to the workplace. Excellent. Thank you. So let me go back to my slides. OK, you and can, um, we will crack on. I'll stop share so you can do that. There you go. Perfect. So what's, why it's important to us is because gamification gets people to take action using the techniques and mechanics of games. So why is that important in a project environment? Well, project delivery, as we all know, it involves getting work done through other people. And engagement is a combination of understanding what stakeholders need, getting them to take action and being able to influence their behaviour in a way that helps them contribute effectively to the project. So engagement for me is all about working with people to build support to achieve the intended outcomes. Often though, we don't have direct management responsibility and line management over the people who are working in our project teams. So we have to use all the techniques available to us to do that, to, to understand, to convince them to take action, to influence their position within, a, within the project setting so we can help them and encourage them to do the work that they need to do. We've got uh, a great advantage in our PMOs and in our project teams that normally people want to engage with us on a project because they had a fantastic idea and we are the people who are delivering it for them. However, as we all know, it doesn't always work out that way. People have lots of different priorities and we want them to engage with us and we want them to engage with the process of managing the project as well. I think the world that projects operate in, we need the engagement because we can't get people to do what we want them to do unless they are prepared to give us their time and give us their attention. So anything we can do that helps nudge them in that direction has to be a good thing. And that encourages them to take action because ultimately that's what we want. We can talk 
as much as we like about how wonderful projects are and how the business value will be delivered by doing this thing. But unless people actually sit down at their desks or work with each other and get on and do their tasks, the project will not get completed. So we want action taking as the end result of all of this. I've probably made this point already because with, without the engagement of our stakeholders, people just don't listen. They, they don't have the opportunity to listen because lives are busy. They have their work-life balance to maintain. They have 15 other projects they're probably working on. And you know, your email could be at the bottom of 100 emails that they've received that day. So people don't always naturally prioritize paying attention to what we as project managers are doing. And if they don't do that, then they aren't taking action on the project they aren't doing what we need them to do, and they aren't committed to the delivery of the project. At least they're not evidencing to us that they're committed by, by doing any action, taking any tasks, and they might not also be committed to the process of project management. So it's not just engaging with doing their project work, it's also engaging with following the change control process, understanding what we need to do if you identify a new risk, turning up to meetings because they sit on the project board engaging with the process of governance, all that kind of stuff as well, and the journey that will help them get this project delivered um, with your help. So when we put engagement and gamification together, we get engagification, which I don't know if it sounds like it could be a real word. Um, and that's in a project context is enhancing stakeholder engagement through gamification techniques. Now, I'll be honest, gamification techniques will not work in every situation, but adding them to your toolbox gives you more things to choose from as a project manager. And it's just going to bring a bit more fun into the way that you work as a team. So who doesn't want more fun, really, or more options to choose from and things that you can then tailor to the work environment that you find yourself in? OK, so let's look at what this looks like in real life, because up until now, it's a great concept. But how do we actually make this stuff work? There are five principles of engagification that I'm going to share with you today. And here they are. So we've got the first one being track your steps. Then you can take small actions, create feedback loops, keep it simple. And then our fifth principle is making it special. So I'll go through each of those and give you examples of how we see that gamification technique used outside of projects and then how you can apply it to your stakeholder communities as well. So let's get started. The first principle is track your steps, and that shows people where they are in the journey for the project, and it helps them visualize how much progress has been made and what there still is to do. So this is visually making progress, you know, a, a way that you can track your progress. This is what it looks like in games. I'm sure you've, you can think of plenty of examples where you can track your progress in games. Um, Hidden Folks is something I play on my iPad, and it's you can see here I've got certain levels with padlock that I've highlighted and they are locked. So I can see where I've been. I can see what levels I still have to unlock and I can see where I'm going as well if you scroll across. Uh, this is an, another game and you can see here that the journey is mapped out by dots on a, on a pathway, on a string. And you can see what's coming up. So level 104, which is my next level, has got flames around it, which means it's a super hard level, which is probably why I have <laughs> procrastinated and haven't played it yet. But if I get to level 106, it's got sparkles on, so I get an extra prize. I don't know what the prize will be. But they're making it very clear as to where I need to go. And I can scroll up and down and see the rest of the journey. You also see this in project management tools. So this is monday.com, but loads of them do it. It's the same principle, and it's part of their software onboarding process. So here they're saying, here are the different steps. You've got a tick on step number one because you've done it, and you've got two more steps to do. And there's also the kind of thermometer bar as well on a different part of the screen. So how do I complete my profile? Uh -huh, I have these steps to do, and some of them are green and some of them are not, and the bar goes across. So it's very easy to track progress. OK, so to thinking through how we can apply that concept of making it step by step for people and making progress visible, we can do that in projects. This is PowerPoint. This is a really easy graphic to create based on a project that I was working on where we were looking at the patient journey through a hospital. So we created this, just showing the patient journey. And then when we're talking about the project and how our project is affecting different parts of that patient journey, you can highlight the box that we're in in a different color. So we can see that you know, this is the area that we're working on right now and we've got the rest of this journey to go. Now, 
not all projects are going to be that linear. So you can do things based on um, milestones. This is a made up project that you can see on the screen now, but it's milestone led. So you could say we're at milestone number one and we've got this. This is the rest of the journey. This is what's coming for us. Even milestones don't always work for projects. So this is an example of a real project. Um, this was our GDPR project at the company I worked, my last company I worked in. And we have various different work streams that covered important areas to do with the sort of content of the project, the delivery work streams. And then we had cross-cutting functional teams that, that had to work across all the different areas. So while this then becomes quite difficult to um, put together because you have to really think through what are our work streams, how does it all fit together? The diagram is a great way of being able to explain how the whole thing fits together and you can highlight each different section. So when we're talking about something to do with HR, I can make that HR block a different colour. And it's just showing people what we've completed. So we could colour them all in green when they've been done or, or colour code them according to red, amber, green. There's lots of things you can do with a diagram that shows your project and your project plan in a very visible way to create a roadmap to let people know how we're doing with tracking our steps. So whatever feels right to you, you can do. It's just creating a graphic that sums up your project, making sure that you can change the colours or, or refer to it often with arrows pointing at where you are and, and use that as a communication tool. So I have another question for you. Do you use those kind of roadmaps or any kind of roadmap really to show the journey of your project? I, um, I think with the tools that we've got available to us within Gantt charts and things, we have got the technology to be able to do that, but it does involve setting it up at the beginning and then using it as a communication tool going through. And that's, um, I can see the mentee chart popping up on the screen there. Lots of people saying yes, so that's fantastic. One of the things that we did actually during our GDPR project was to uh, create, a, create a slide template and we had the, the stage of which part of the project we were in at the top of every slide. So as we were going through the presentations, people could see, okay, right, this relates to that part of the project, right, that relates to this part of the project. So it looks like the majority of people are using roadmaps to show the project journey. So thank you for taking part in that one. I know, Elizabeth, it's funny, even just looking at this, because I think we all use roadmaps, but even just at the beginning there, when you just said about visualizing it, it even just kind of reminded me that often I use roadmaps because there's always a project plan and there's always a PowerPoint slide because the directors want one page to tell me what the status is. But yes. I frequently forget that the stakeholders, particularly maybe the more junior stakeholders, should see how the project is moving as well, because it can be a bit frustrating if you're constantly dragged. Like I, I software development projects drag a lot of people into test. They're not necessarily involved in the bigger picture. They don't they have a bit of a tunnel vision. I get dragged mm -hmm. in to do some testing in my area, but it's just a kind of a little bit of a reminder for me is to show them where the project is and remind them like how far how far on we've come and maybe what their part was in that as well. That exactly. we got to the stage because they did the testing or whatever. So um so we definitely use them, but I think I probably focus a bit more on senior management than mm -hmm. across all the stakeholders. So it's um, interesting to so see 48 responses there. So as you said, the majority were, were yes, which is which is good. Yeah. Um, yes, I think that's absolutely true. And the great thing about it is once you've created it, there's no reason not to share it with everybody. It's, it's there, it exists as a communication tool, and then you can decide how you use it in your um, team meetings or with members of the project team. So we've got some options to track your steps. You can create your high level maps plans for the journey and you can signpost to people where we are as we saw even smaller things though you can number emails so if you've got a set of emails that you need to send out to people over a certain amount of time you can just say this is email one of five this is email two of five and then people know what to expect they know what's coming and they know exactly where they are in the journey of the five emails and you can set targets as well and, and if you're a pmo person then that could be something that's relevant to you around projects closed projects um open projects in progress any kind of measurement type metric that you can use and report back on and, and display in a visual way could be something that you can use use this principle for okay our second principle then is taking small actions and we're looking for taking getting people to say yes to a small thing before we ask them for a large idea and we're making it easy for them to engage with us by making their first engagement with us very small 
So this is the foot in the door technique. And if you've read um, anything by Robert Cialdini, the, his influence book, for example, he'll talk, he talks about it in there. And it talks about getting someone to make a small commitment before asking for a larger one. So the example that um, is in the book is you sign a petition before you donate to a cause, and then you put a small sign in your window about something before you put a big placard on the lawn. So there's different sorts of levels of commitment we can ask stakeholders to do. How it looks in non-project environments, Facebook is excellent at doing this if you use Facebook. There's a whole selection of different things that you can do to engage with content on Facebook, ranging from virtually no effort on your part, just stopping the scroll and stopping to read something, through to sharing a piece of content or something interesting with your friends, tagging somebody in a post. And all of those different steps take a different level of engagement. I mean, they're all tiny, tiny things to do in the grand scheme of things. But in terms of the Facebook algorithm, they involve you at different levels. And the idea is the first thing to do is get people to stop and read. And then other levels of engagement follow on from that in small ways. So what does that look like for us at work? Well, you can use voting emails, voting buttons, sorry, on emails, and you can ask questions. Things like, how do you think your apartment, your department or your team might be affected by this change? Before you ask them to then give up a resource to work full time on your team for six weeks. So you're trying to engage them in a conversation before you, um, before you make a bigger ask. You can also provide a template answer. So I did this in emails where I, had to make a change to a hospital process and I needed to them to confirm that they had completed their actions. So I sent out an email saying, this is what I need you to do. And then at the bottom, it had a, basically a, a section with gaps in where I just used the um, underscore button to draw a line and they could go to that section and put in a number and just confirm they'd done it. And then all they had to do was just hit reply, type the number in and, it, and they were done. So they didn't have to do too much research. I was making it very easy for them to fill in this template. Now, voting buttons, I am personally an Outlook user, so I know how this works in Outlook. I'm sure you could do it in other packages as well if you use Gmail or other tools. Um, but the reason I like voting buttons is it makes it very easy for people to just take a very small step. They don't even have to reply to the email. They go, they choose a date for a meeting, for example, in this example I've created here. Um, but there's other things that you could get them to do if it's a very quick sort of stakeholder survey around um, voting on requirements or what do they want to do for their team celebration. We'll come on to celebrations a little bit in a minute. So that's another tool that you can use that's really simple. Our third principle is creating feedback loops and we want to give people the opportunity to provide feedback in a kind of immediate sort of way and also to for us to provide feedback to them. So we want to create a feedback loop with communication because a lot of what we might think of as project communication is actually project broadcast where we're sending out notes, uh, we're sending out meeting minutes, we're sending out presentations, we're doing a presentation, but we don't always create an opportunity for people to respond back to us and for us to listen. So we can do that relatively easily. Um, and in fact, there's tools that make that easy. So I've put up a few there be interesting to see if any of you have used any of those. Jamboard uh, is free and it's one of the ones that I didn't know about until just this year and the whole pandemic thing. But actually, it's a great just whiteboard tool where you can put sticky notes and things like that. So you could create a Jamboard in Google and then just direct people to go and fill in sticky notes for you. And the other ones tend to be around agile techniques and making sure people can leave, leave feedback and contribute in a kind of retrospective, agile retrospective way. But you can edit the questions and change it, it could be something that any of your stakeholders could engage with if you wanted to. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a myriad of ways that we can receive feedback as project managers. It's just making sure that you are asking yourself the question, how are people able to get in touch with me? How are people able to get in touch with the project team? And are we doing enough listening? So do you have a simple way for any stakeholder to get in touch with you? And more importantly, <laughs> do they know about it? Because I remember we created an inbox for doctors to get in touch with us about one of the projects I was working on. And the, the way that we had shared it with people was not, not very clear, not, didn't invite feedback. It was more of an afterthought. So we have, we had to change the way that we communicated about 
the way we were open to feedback. So that looks fantastic. That looks like people are aware of it and hopefully they are using it. And maybe this is a prompt for any of those of you who've selected, they don't know if they're aware of it or you're not currently using that as a tool to yeah. see if um, you can think again about how you collect feedback on your projects. And Liz, but I'm, I'm actually really, I'm thinking again about like, because I, I do think I'm trained to think of a stakeholder as somebody senior, like, you know, like a sponsor or, you know, a senior manager. And it is, um, it's all of the stakeholders because they're all influential in some way. So some can yes, have, yes. A, have a serious impact directly on your project, but a lot of them can have a serious impact indirectly on your project. Like if it's, if it, and, I'm, and I'm actually going through this at the moment, trying to get testers in an environment where people can't go into the building because we're in lockdown. Mm -hmm. is you know it, it's it's tricky and it, it really does rely on the relationships that I've built with people in the business yes and, you know, I'm asking them to go that extra mile for me at the moment literally <laughs> as well as figuratively so yeah so but it's great to see the people and that they are aware of it but I, I mean I, for myself it's definitely a rethink just to kind of go back to your um track the steps and you mm -hmm. know make sure that they're getting a visual of it but yeah, yes um it's positive and hopefully the people that think that they're not aware of it are they have an opportunity now to go back and make sure that people are exactly so just a little reminder i think so here are some ways that you can create feedback loops as well as what you're already currently doing or in addition in addition to or instead of because for different types of communication you may want to create a specific feedback loop just for that particular message the easiest thing is talking to people but you can't do that if you've got 500 stakeholders so you can either prioritize your key important stakeholders or if you've got a much smaller team, regular calendar reminders just to check in with people. And now we're doing so much more in a virtual environment. That's really important. You can ask for feedback. Often I think we create these feedback opportunities, but people don't necessarily feel that they can contribute or we're not actively asking for it. So you can do that. Just run the lessons learned meeting, do the stop, start, continue exercise. I've got a template for that if, if that's not a tool that people are aware of um, quizzes surveys anything that makes it people makes it easy for people to get in touch a chat channel dedicated inbox all that kind of stuff that you can do and just buddy people up so you don't have to be responsible for all of the communication you could create some structure within your project team where certain people face off to different areas and different stakeholders and become the, the partner for that particular part of the business our fourth principle is keep it simple so we're trying to stick to one message at a time one topic, one outcome per piece of communication, and we're meeting them where we are, where they are, sorry, not assuming that they have any prior knowledge. Now, the keep it simple principle I really like because I don't like receiving really long emails. I don't have the attention span for a really long email. However, it's not going to work for every team. And I did some time management training with a legal department. And one of the things that they were struggling with was being constantly interrupted by emails from more junior members of the team all through the day. And so we talked about how could they best consolidate their work so that the junior members of the team still felt they had access to the senior lawyers to get the feedback on what they were doing, but that it wasn't a constant bombardment through the day. So actually they decided they didn't want to stick to one message at a time. They wanted to create one email in the morning and the junior team member would input all of their questions. And then about four o'clock, everyone would send off their messages to their senior advisor who would then have the rest of the day to be able to respond and support. And it, it was a better time management answer for them. However, when I'm working with clinicians and people in, in a healthcare setting, the shorter the email, the better, because they're often reading it on a mobile device, walking around the hospital. It's not practical for them to get to a computer to find a resource that I've shared or, or download a PDF or anything like that. So I have to be really clear and really precise. I should have found a PMI example for this one, but sorry. Uh, so this is a, a survey where you've got one question on a page and you can see the track your steps bar at the top. So you've only got one question to answer. It's very simple. Other tools like Process Street do it as well with um, checklists. So anything that is a checklist that directs people to just take one step at a time, take one action, do one thing, and then move on to the next thing, that can be really helpful as well. So we have one topic or request per message if you think that's going to work for your community. Short sentences and paragraphs and matching the detail to their prior knowledge. That was a real challenge for me working with some of the um, clinicians and technical people because they have a tendency to communicate in the language that is appropriate for their peers which is either hugely technical or 
um, hugely clinical, <laughs> lots of medical jargon, neither of which approaches are great when you're talking to executive stakeholders. They're fine when they're talking to people who have the same level of knowledge as them. But when I was a project manager, when I was project managing a particular project, I'm thinking of working with a radiology team. I had to be really careful who I put forward to do different types of communication. And I had to rewrite some of it because what people were producing just was far too long and far too detailed for the audience that we were trying to match it to. So match it to what you think they need to know, what they um, are going to be able to understand based on the jargon and the level of knowledge they already have. Checklists are another thing I mentioned and being mobile friendly because so many of the people that we're working with at the moment um, will be dialing in in the evening on their phone, maybe in front of the TV as well. Even though these days we tend to be more based at our desk, there will still be a lot of people who'll be accessing information in a mobile way. Okay, we come to our last principle, which is making it special. And this is basically just giving people the opportunity to appreciate what we've done as a project team and to engage with us in a fun way rather than just in a, oh goodness, Elizabeth's asking me to do more work type way. So we want to celebrate success, but also celebrate progress because sometimes you know, on a project that's two years long, waiting till the end to celebrate success is, is a, a big effort. <laughs> it's a big ask of people. So we can celebrate various different steps along the way. So I think this is my final question for you, actually. So if you can hop over to Nancy for the last time. For, um, hmm, I, don't, <laughs> I think it's the last one. <laughs> when was the last time that you celebrated success on your project? So some people are saying recently, some people are saying ages ago. We don't celebrate project success. Seven people so far. Eight people are saying we don't celebrate it. You know, this is a tough one because we've actually had an opportunity about three times in the last three months. And normally for us, celebrating success in a project could be a massive marketing launch, mm -hmm. which would be a big party for everybody in the office. Or it might just be as simple as, you know, just having lunch out with the team. And because of the current situation and the lockdown and, and um, the social distancing, we haven't, and actually we've struggled with ways to come up with acknowledging people's efforts. So, so maybe this is one for people in the chat or for the, there's, a, I'm gonna, there's gonna be an opportunity to put comments and questions in next. Like that's a genuine question. If people have come up with ways to recognize and celebrate success that doesn't involve, um, you know, a face-to-face -face lunch or like, you know, it, in fairness, the company I work with have been fantastic at celebrating success. So this has been a bit weird for us, you know, and there's been some big projects that have gone live as well. So, um, but we don't celebrate success for those, for those eight, that's something that needs to be changed. And even like sometimes in some companies I've struggled to get budget. That's true. But I have to, you can still celebrate it without getting budget. And, you know, even if it's a, a down to sending an email to say thank you and making sure that it goes to the right managers and that the right people see it for a lot of people, that's much more important to them than being taken out for, mm -hmm. for lunch or a few drinks or, you know, having some donuts delivered or pizza delivered to the office. So, um, and, and just, just make sure that you make a habit of it because yes. you won't always get the budget, unfortunately. And that's very true. And we, we did the same. We had a letter, we had about 50 stakeholders contribute to a, a very strategic project and no money, obviously, because why, why put money into a project budget for celebrating success and thanking people for their efforts when you're spending millions of pounds on something. Um, but we, we ended up creating a letter mail merge, <laughs> which came from our CEO and talked about the person's contribution. Now, behind the scenes, it was me who put in the paragraphs about what that individual person had contributed. But the CEO, to his credit, did actually sign them all by hand and we, we distributed them. And people were overwhelmed. I mean, some of the people were very junior members of the, the, the workforce in the, the widest scale of things and had been involved in requirements, contributions and working out process mapping and, and doing user testing and things like that. And they were really grateful to have had their contribution acknowledged. And that was meaningful to them. And we've done other things like quizzes where we hid, um, we hid different icons on the staff internet. And people had to navigate through the the internet looking for these icons and that cost me a box of chocolates I then had to post to post to a particular office where the person was who won mm. uh, so there, there are things you can do and I can see in the chat Tracy suggested using online companies to send out small hampers instead of going out yep and having that joined up with virtual team nights so that's something else that you can do is look at what you can do on an online basis 
Um, I've got some ideas, actually, if we've got time at the end and people want some more yeah. suggestions, then <laughs> we can chat about that. And I have just before I hand back over to you there, Elizabeth, guys, you can any questions you have, you can pop them into the chat. And I've also got questions and comments on the mentee. So if you have the code there and you have it open on your screen, if you've got any comments or questions, pop them in or you can use Zoom as well. If you, you know, sometimes people prefer to use Zoom. So I shall hand back over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Sorry about that. I was on mute. Um, we talked about many of these things that were on this this slide here around baking it special, and it's all about celebrating success and progress. And people like to be rewarded for their contribution, as we said. And most people don't expect it, but they do love it when it happens. So you can become a standout project manager who looks after their team and is known for creating a fun environment where their work is rewarded simply by taking the time to say thank you to people, because lots of other people won't not necessarily project people because i think as a project management community we are far more aware of our reliance on matrix management and goodwill and having to negotiate for resource but many people in their day jobs perhaps don't hear thank you as often as they they could do so it's very easy to do and um for example you've got the project launch as an opportunity different milestones different points in the business case being signed off it could be opportunities for celebration uh, there's one team I work with that does a non-work Friday stand-up meeting. They have a stand-up meeting every day, but the Fridays ones, we don't talk about work. It's just what are we doing at the weekend and general chit-chat for team building, which is something that this day and age, because that's a virtual meeting that we have with people all over the world, it's um, it, it's something perhaps we could, could be adopted in other teams. There's lots of project-based milestones that we can celebrate if we create a reason to but then there's often team-based milestones as well and people milestones when someone's been with the company for a certain length of time or they have a birthday or there's some kind of celebration for whatever other reason um you know if you look hard enough you will always find something that is worth celebrating or that you can create a moment to to celebrate these are some of the things that i've used um a scavenger hunt is quite a good one to do with a virtual team it works better in person, if I'm honest. And I've done this where I've been out with a team around town and we've looked for certain things and we've had to do missions and come back and fill it in as a team building activity. But you can do it in a virtual environment. And I've done that too, where every day people have shared something. So day one was share a picture of your drink um, that you have in the mornings. Day two was share a picture of what it looks like outside your office window, things like that. So when you're doing that in a Facebook group or in Slack or just on email, it's just another way to connect with people. And you don't even need an excuse to do a scavenger hunt. It can just be something you do as a team building activity. Um, buzzword bingo. I've got a buzzword bingo sheet as well. So if you want to use that on any of your conference calls, <laughs> we can get you that. And countdowns, which is again, a little bit like tracking your steps and making progress visible. It's a way of um, counting down to a project launch and uh, you can use like advent calendar software there's a free one that you can get which counts down uh, you can open a door a virtual door on an advent calendar every day and it doesn't we don't have to call it an advent calendar but it's just a countdown calendar to project go live perhaps there are some different steps that you could take to celebrate getting closer and closer to your launch Right, so that's it. We've come to the end of our five. So we've looked at tracking your steps. We've looked at taking small actions. We've created our feedback loops and we've done some things around keeping it simple and making sure that we're communicating in effective ways. And we're trying to make it special for people. And games are really good at making it special because they, you know, you can unlock new levels or you can get 10 extra golden rings for something. It's a very simple thing that we can translate from those tiny engagements through to our, our workplace engagements as well. So what we've looked at is we've covered gamification projects and our five principles, and hopefully I've given you some ideas about how you can take these principles back to think about how you're doing communication and stakeholder engagement at work at the moment and how you can elevate the way that you work with stakeholders to be a little bit more than just management. Because as Katrina mentioned at the beginning, a lot of what we are taught as project managers is very much around the management processes of how do you get a stakeholder to come to a meeting or um, how do you fill in a stakeholder register and assess power and influence? But there's, it's quite light on actually those day-to-day -day relationships and little things you can do to make it easier, to be easy to do business with, to be easy to work with as, as a project manager and as a team. 
I did want to leave you though with some tips because if you've I feel like we've talked quite broadly about lots of different things and sometimes it's easy to I want to keep things simple I want to give you something really actionable that you can take away and and try later this week or into next week so if you take nothing away from this presentation apart from this slide then at least you'll be able to test out some of these strategies and see if there are things that work for you and as I said at the beginning some of these might work and be great for your community some of these might fall flat on your face and not be things that you want to adopt but what we're trying to do is extend the range of tools that you've got available to you so that you can pick and choose and make great decisions about how best to get people to engage with the process of project management for your team. So my tips here, you can use your voting buttons in an email, find a reason to do that and get people to click yes or no or choose a choose an answer. If you're one of those people who haven't celebrated success at all or recently, then think about how you can plan a celebration we need it right now we need <laughs> we, the people the teams that i work with are all feeling a little bit deflated especially as we're about to head into winter it's all dark and gray and you know the, the conversations that we're having are, are very much that people need to be need to have something to look forward to so perhaps there's something you can do around that if you don't already have a visual map for your project or if you're a program manager could you create one for a program with various different portions of the projects highlighted underneath your program umbrella. Think creatively about how you could create a visual map of your project to show people where, where you are on the journey. And just check it's easy to get in contact. Even, even those of you who said that you do have feedback loops in place and mechanisms, check when was the last time anybody actually used it? Is there anybody actually monitoring that, that generic email box? And what happens when someone goes on holiday? So just make sure that those processes are there. And if you haven't got any of those feedback loops in place then maybe a follow-up step would be to see what you can do just in your next team meeting ask you don't have to wait for the end of your project to do lessons learned you can just do it now do it in your next team meeting and have have those conversations right I feel like we've got through that quite quickly but I know we've actually only got uh, 15 or so minutes left so we, don't have much time. we do have some questions as well so if you're okay Brilliant. I'll across to the the menti so guys you can have a question in chat here and elizabeth will see it and i'm just going to share my a screen again on the menti poll so you guys will be able to see that um so it scrolls so um what do you find to be the most useful mechanism to ensure engagement from stakeholders that are resistant to change now there is a tough one there is a tough one guys that are oh. resistant to change, resistant to change. <laughs> yeah. the key there is to do the understanding part of engagement so why are they resistant to change there can be lots of different reasons why people don't want to change because it's too hard because it means they'll be out of a job because they can't be bothered they don't see it's important um, they don't understand the rationale behind it they're too busy your project's not a priority all these different things could be reasons why they're resistant and if you can understand those that kind of driving factor of what's what's blocking them from being supportive of what you are doing that's a good starting point and there's actually a tool I can't remember the name of the guy it's Rick Mora I think it's energybartools.com and if you go to energybartools.com I'll make sure Katrina's got the correct link uh, for, for sharing after it actually gives you a, a way of ranking your stakeholders to say what level of engagement do you need them to have what level of engagement do they have and then it gives you this little video to watch. I mean, it's a, it's designed to so that you will buy his stuff and um, <laughs> the sign up for his newsletter and things like that. But there's a, um, a a quick tip at the end of each of those different options because sometimes people might be resistant to change and you don't care. You know, it doesn't matter to you that they're resistant. Other times they're your key stakeholder, and it really really makes a huge difference that they don't want this thing to happen and they are blocking you at every turn. So your response strategies will be different depending on your analysis of that stakeholder. I feel like it could be a whole presentation in itself, but I know there's other things flicking on the screen. So, you know, I, I had um, like in my current job, I had one particular person that I was doing all the communications, um, going into my weekly meeting, telling everyone that they needed to present their status report, provide their status updates, whatever it was. And there was one person that just, it was like, um, Oh, it's just not doing it like it's just and it was really infuriating but actually you kind of hit the nail on the head um because it was it, and it it really turned out to be the most ridiculously simple thing but um it, this this guy would do absolutely anything that i asked him to do as long as i asked him directly mm. and it wasn't anything 
deliberate, like, I don't take group instructions. It was just, that was just how he works. It was sit with me face to face and say, so I need you to send your status report once a fortnight, whatever it was. Then there was no problem. It was, it was just strange. It was just global group communications just didn't work. And I've actually found this, there's quite, um, it, it's helped me if you send out those comms that say I need everyone to do it's just take the five minutes afterwards to check in with each of the people to go so listen you're okay with that is that is that a problem for you are you yes. going to be able to do that on Mondays like I'm asking um and it, it it just like I said it didn't turn out to be any anyone being difficult it was just some people just don't read those group emails and they they don't think that they're for them I don't know it was absolutely a so this is important about how do you best communicate with stakeholders and choosing a communication method that resonates with the person receiving the message and in those group emails sometimes it's just easier to send them out individually or to bcc everybody so that it feels very much like it's coming to them personally um, instead of just saying hey guys because then it's there's a risk that oh you know that's not to me i don't have to do it whereas if you can put people's initials against an action in an email or if you can say dear katrina elizabeth tracy blah 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 please find below five things that you all need to do it's it's trial and error sometimes with people but once you've cracked it and you understand the best way to communicate with them then your results will be much better it is the, there's a question up here at the top actually i think it was the first question that came in and it was um why is your website called the girl's guide to product <laughs> <laughs> you'd be surprised i do get that um i do get asked that quite a lot back in the day about i don't know lots of lot, a long time ago 2006 um i was trying to, I was writing a book, my first one, which was this one, Project Management in the Real World. And people said, oh, you need a website. So I thought, okay, well, I will. And I wanted it to be my guide to the world of project management and my female perspective on what was, was going on. Because at the time I was going to conferences, seeing basically men on the stage. I was reading industry press, seeing basically men's pictures next to the articles. And I worked in an IT department where we had maybe 30 project managers, 50, 50 men and women. So what I was seeing in the media was not a reflection of my experiences as a working woman. So I thought there's not enough stuff about shoes and chocolate and handbags and how that affects project management and the work-life balance and a female perspective on the job. And um, that's where that started from really. In hindsight, now that I'm 44, I'm not sure that it's the best name, but you know, I've, I've got a kind of stuck with it now so it was it's i'm the girl it's my guide to the world of project management that's where that comes from well i mean you can always create a linking one the boy scouts guide to pm as well, <laughs> you know, it is. It, look it's it's a catchy title and i think maybe girls girl guides is universal maybe i don't know um but it certainly catches people's attention so um oh and i you, i see you've popped in the link there for energy bar tools and i will make sure that goes out in the notes as well so any tips for dealing with stakeholders and this uh, there is a way to stop the scrolling by the way I'm, I'm just like in one of those any tips for dealing with stakeholders who are external to the project organization for example subcontractors yes um i don't think of them as external stakeholders i try very much to create a relationship where we are where they're fully Im immersed in our world, even if they're only part-time and they're working and supporting other clients, we need to treat them with the same level of openness and honesty and integrity as we, we do with our own internal members of the team. So I try to make sure that from a communication perspective that they receive everything that they can. Obviously there's always gonna be some confidential information and, and budget stuff that is not appropriate to share with them. But broadly, if there's no reason not to include them on internal comms, or anything that would help them better understand our organization, then I would try to do that. Mm -hmm. um, then I'd make, make time for them because I often find that as a small company working with external people, we end up not having enough of their attention. So again, it's, it's having conversations at the beginning. How can I be easy to do business with? What do you need from me in order to you, for you to excel in this contract position and to be really open about when they're not performing as well because we've we've had i've had to have very difficult conversations with with subcontractors who have not met their side of the bargain mm. and we've had to say as a customer this experience is poor and this is what we would like to see differently and this is we know that perhaps we're not the best customer in the world either so what could we do differently so that this whole thing comes better together and um that was really the foundation of the 
there's a case study in the customer centric project management book that that talks about how we work with a third party supplier to try to improve our relationships with them and we did basically we did lessons learned on both sides every month for 10 months and the both sides got much more out of it but it's interesting that you say that um it's particularly when you talk about the being maybe a smaller company for that uh, subcontractor and and you are you're not getting their undivided attention um and i've i've one of the things that i employ is i always try and get a a face-to-face or even a virtual it's usually a virtual face-to-face even before the current situation Mm -hmm. um and one of the things i underline is any key dates so like recently we had a compliance related project and there were key dates so it was do you understand that these are the dates i need to know that you know will you communicate with me regularly if it's if, if you can only do once a week if you can only do once a fortnight i don't mind but you need to tell me that you understand that there's a date that you must deliver by and if you're and if you sign up to that then i start to relax a bit Otherwise, what happens is I just hammer them constantly. I'm, I'm ringing them every day. I'm emailing them every day. So it, it is sometimes it's just if you if you sign that invis- invisible agreement with me, then I'll I'll uh, just relax a little bit for yes. sure. And I think understanding the why behind the project is often something we forget to do with external stakeholders. Sometimes we forget to do it with internal stakeholders as well. And in healthcare, it's often quite an easy why because we're doing something that makes patient lives better or that makes it easier for staff to spend more time with patients so just making that why really obvious to people so you can say look if we do this we get a better result for our you know our cancer patients if we do this it's going to give physio staff more time in the day to be able to serve people better so making have a vision have a high level statement about why you're doing the project to make sure everybody knows it even those external external people so they know what they're working for it's not just a task list it's a it's a thing it makes a difference adds value I, i've highlighted another one there because it is a tough one if what if powerful stakeholders don't play their part and the sponsor is not willing to help you out well um, then you've got a rubbish sponsor you have to give um, you tough questions Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> no but this is this is fair this is often project sponsors are not willing they're they're absent they don't engage that doesn't make them a good sponsor, but we have to live with the people that we get, right? So you just have to make the most of it. When I was in this situation, what we did was we identified a powerful stakeholder, a powerful person. I know there's there's some feedback going that says person is a better word to use than stakeholder and definitely better than resource. And I agree that, I like that. Um, So we identified a powerful doctor who was influential within his community of peers. Mm. And we used him to give the message because he was uh, open to talking and sharing about our project. And frankly, a doctor is always going to be more influential over other doctors than me, who has no medical qualification and works in the IT department. You know, nobody wants to hear from me. But if we we got him on side and then we used him to influence his peers. So my suggestion for getting in front of powerful stakeholders would be do not get hung up about the fact that it has to be you or your team. Find somebody else who can negotiate an influence on your behalf and spread the message about the project. And maybe you'll have more success that way. It is, I think again, Elizabeth, it is that kind of that one-to-one conversation, and, and there's there's definitely a difficulty to hear because the person does stay way above your pay grade because there's a suggestion that the person may not be accessible to you as well. Um, I recently I challenge that as well, to be honest. Yeah. Sure. And, Why not that, bring up their secretary or their PA and say, "How do I get in front of this person?" If yeah. you're going to rock the boat and cause waves, then yeah. obviously you need to think about your career and how that's going to affect you. But if it's just your assumption that that person will not speak to you because you are a lowly project manager and they are an important person, then perhaps it's worth just challenging that belief. Ask around, has anyone else ever spoken to them? What's, I think you'll what find would be the worst that, that would happen if you just rang them? Yeah, and, and you'll, you'll find that, the, that often a reputation is maybe built off that as well, of being remote and being untouchable. Um, yes. but if the if right they're path. a stakeholder on the project, then you're the project manager. You should have the right to speak to every stakeholder, in my yeah. view. What's what's their interest I, I had a, a sponsor recently and actually to be fair this person transitioned from being a key stakeholder to actually being the sponsor um, because of reorg changes and we had a lovely chat when he rang me up and he said so I've just come off the steering meeting of that project and uh, like it was a great meeting and I you know uh, and I, I just had to get involved there and roll up my sleeves and I just had to help them get to the decision but like I really shouldn't have had to have done that <laughs> and it was a fabulous <laughs> conversation because I just said now 
this is a perfect time for me to tell you that you have just officially transitioned from being a stakeholder to being the key sponsor, because that is exactly. exactly your job on a steering meeting. We don't always have the power to make those decisions. And you were senior, you came to the meeting, you got involved in the conversation and you led the discussion towards a decision and everyone left feeling really empowered and really happy. But that was your job. Exactly. That wasn't yeah. a half an hour of your day that you'll never get back. That was a half an hour of what you were supposed to be doing for the day. But I think, again, maybe go all the way back to your first point, track your steps, that maybe it's important for everybody, even the sponsors, to realise because you came to that steering meeting and because you helped make that decision or because you released that budget, the project moved on to the next yes. step. And it couldn't have done that without you. That maybe they need a virtual pack and pat on the back as well, you know. Yeah, or give it to project yeah. board members. It's not just the team members. Yes, yeah. and roles and responsibilities documentation helps as well to make people clear as to what it actually is that they have signed up to do when they join a project team. Definitely. Okay, well, we've got time for one more. I shall, yeah, take, take one more and then I shall wrap up. I'm not, I think there's a lot of um, comments there. I just highlighted that one with regards to the roadmaps and milestones. Yep, I agree. Simple milestones, rag statuses, excellent. Anything that helps you communicate visually. And it does and go back to your, your point four is keep it simple. So it's not um, the, the long winded emails. Um, and, you, and like you made a very valid point there. A lot of us now are checking these things on our mobile phones and those are not conducive mechanisms to read a really long email. So, you know, pictures work best for sure. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of feedback just saying thanks for the use, very useful tips and some great reminders on simple ways to, oh, to, um, to engage. So. Uh, that's that's really good and it is look I, I suppose that's it sometimes I think a lot of the times we know these things it isn't about reinventing the wheel it's about just remember when you're getting frustrated with people it isn't always about managing the stakeholder sometimes it's just about engaging the stakeholder yes build the relationships and then the rest of it just falls into place yeah exactly so guys I will um I'll just say I'm now trying to do two things at one time and that never works for me. So I'll apologize, but I'm just going to share my slides again. Effectively is what I'm trying to do. Just so you know. Um, there, I have figured it out. The technology will not beat me. So we're nearly coming to the end there, as you can see. So I always end up on this one, Elizabeth. We have more webinars coming up on the schedule. So as you heard me mention earlier, thanking Auxilion, our sponsor, you guys as our members and the sponsors that we have in Ireland make this possible. And we've had a schedule of webinars this year, which have basically run from, from March until June, we had we had one a week. In fact, there was a couple of weeks where we had two. And since, um, since coming back in September, we basically had three a month. And that's off a little bit in response to the fact that, um, well, sometimes we're a little bit tired of webinars. I think that's fair to say that these are not the only webinars that we're all going to. So um, check out the options that you have with the Ireland chapter of the PMI. If you registered for this event and you registered giving me your PMI member number, then I am going to automatically take care of the PDU claim for this. So you don't have to worry about that. And any time that you want, you can use this link here. You can go and check your your own dashboard for your PDUs, because we all know that's important running up to certification. Bookmark these links if you can. So you will get this slide deck from me. You'll also get Elizabeth's slide deck. I'll share them all up on the um, up on the PMIIreland.org website and go into the 2020 archive. You'll see all of the previous events. For any upcoming events, check out the list of events. You'll see that we've got some coming up here already. There's also projectmanagement.com and there's the PMIECC.org. So essentially, if you're at this moment in time trying to grab some more PDUs to keep yourself certified, there are plenty of opportunities for you. We've got a whole list of live webinars coming up and there's also a lot of recorded ones that you can go back through as well. Uh, plenty of opportunities. On, um, I think it's on the 2nd of December, we have a meeting, a chapter meeting. That means that you'll be able to join it. You'll be able to talk to myself, to Jackie Fagan and to Elif who is the Director of Development. And we're gonna go through a couple of things with you. How to earn PDUs, so if you are tracking to maintain your certification, 
ELIF is also going to go through the new exam set up for, for the PMI, which is coming in to being from January onwards. So it's an evening meeting as well. So it's about 90 minutes long. So bring your questions to that and we will show you how to log PDUs while you're in that meeting as well. So you, you'll get an opportunity there. So one final word, because there's plenty of them coming up. Don't forget, International Project Management Day is the 5th of November this year. So um, hopefully, Elizabeth, you remember this as well, because you're part of the community. Um, this is the first year that we're marking it with an actual um, event. We had planned for this to be a face-to-face in-person event, and obviously it's not going to be. But on the 5th of November from 7 until 8.30 p.m., we're going to have a virtual panel discussion. So head over to the PMI webpage and register for that. This is all going to be focused on your career and your brand. So basically, uh, and we're, we're going to have coaching and mentoring as part of that discussion as well. So that's pretty much it for me, guys. We'll share all of the slides up on the on the archive and we'll, we'll share Elizabeth's workbook as well that she gave us. So it just remains for me to say, Elizabeth, thank you so much. It's been really a very interesting and thought provoking webinar today. So thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. We'll hope yes, and hopefully we'll have you back again. So everyone, thank you all for joining us. And we have another webinar coming up next week. In fact, we have two. So we hope to see you all then. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth.